Hello, I'm Andy Teach, host of Andy's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to the Erie Maritime Museum in Erie, Pennsylvania. This video is sponsored by Visit Erie, the tourism promotion agency for Erie County. When planning your trip to Erie, please visit their website, visiterie.com, which will give you information on everything there is to see and do in Erie. Erie was once known as the boiler and engine capital of the world. The museum is housed in the Pennsylvania Electric Company's former East Front Street steam power generating station. This is one of the five original steam generators. The Erie Maritime Museum is dedicated to the War of 1812 with a focus on the Battle of Lake Erie, which is one of the most important battles of the war. In this section of the museum, we learn what led up to the War of 1812, which pitted America and her allies against Great Britain and her allies. Even though America gained her independence from Great Britain in 1783 after the Revolutionary War, Britain still treated her former colonies as a subordinate. Canada was an outpost of the British Empire. The British needed to control the territory around the Great Lakes, including Lake Erie, in order to secure supply routes to protect their fur trade. There was a fear that America, despite being friendly with Canada, would try to conquer Canada. Native Americans had controlled all the land around the Great Lakes until 1795 to 1809, when the tribes lost almost 5 million acres to the American invaders. The Treaty of Paris, signed after the Revolutionary War, stipulated that the British turn over some of their territory around the Great Lakes, but because America delayed paying war debts, the British delayed turning over the territory and supported Native American resistance to America's settling of the land. There were economic and trade disputes between America, Britain, and France that grew during the Napoleonic Wars. In addition, Britain's Royal Navy would stop and seize American ships and force American citizens into British service. In 1807, the crew of the Royal Navy HMS Leopard boarded and seized an American ship, the USS Chesapeake, looking for Royal Navy deserters. There was a short battle, and the USS Chesapeake surrendered. All of these factors contributed to America's declaration of war on June 18, 1812 against the British. The British had superior numbers by far over the Americans when it came to soldiers, sailors, and ships, but the Americans had one big advantage. They were close to their supply lines, and this helped them win the war. Both Great Britain and the United States realized that the Great Lakes were critical to their supply lines. Both sides focused on shoring up their naval forces on Lake Ontario, leaving Lake Erie vulnerable. In September 1812, the Secretary of the Navy ordered the construction of four gunboats to regain control of Lake Erie from the British. He directed that they be built in the protected harbor of Presque Isle Bay in Erie. The Americans captured the British armed brigs Caledonia and Detroit in Black Rock near Buffalo. Merchant vessels were bought and were being converted to armed vessels, but the Black Rock shipyard was attacked by the British, so the ships were moved to Erie. Sailors and supplies came into the Great Lakes region from New England, New York, Philadelphia, and Chesapeake. The British were building ships, but work progressed slowly due to a lack of supplies. The Battle of Lake Erie, sometimes called the Battle of Putten Bay, was fought on September 10, 1813 on Lake Erie off the coast of Ohio. Nine vessels of the United States Navy defeated and captured six vessels of the British Royal Navy. This secured American control of the lake for the rest of the war, helping to ensure that there be no secession of the Northwest to the British in the peace settlement. Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry arrived at Presque Isle to take command of the American fleet in Erie at the end of March 1813. Commander Robert Barclay was appointed to command the British squadron on Lake Erie. When he took command, the crews of his vessels were few in number. However, he immediately set sail on the Queen Charlotte and Lady Prevost. On the morning of September 10, 1813, the Americans saw Barclay's vessels heading for them at Putten Bay. The wind allowed Perry to close an attack. The first shot was fired from the Detroit at 11.45 a.m. Perry hoped to get his two largest brigs, his flagship Lawrence and the Niagara, into firing range quickly, but in the light wind his vessels were slow and the Lawrence was battered by the Detroit and her fire was not as effective as Perry had hoped. The Lawrence was severely damaged by the two British ships. 80% of Lawrence's crew were killed or wounded. When the last gun on Lawrence became unusable, Perry decided to transfer his flag. He rode a half a mile through heavy gunfire to the Niagara while the Lawrence surrendered. The Detroit collided with the Queen Charlotte, 
Both ships were damaged, and almost every officer was killed or severely wounded. Barclay was severely wounded, and his first lieutenant was killed. Most of the smaller British vessels were also disabled. The British then expected the Niagara to lead the American schooners away in retreat. However, once aboard Niagara, Perry ordered the schooners into closer action, while he steered Niagara at Barclay's damaged ships, helped by the strengthening wind. The Caledonia and the American gunboats fired. Although the crews of the Detroit and Queen Charlotte untangled the two ships, they could no longer offer any effective resistance, and both ships surrendered at about 3 p.m. The smaller British vessels tried to flee, but were overtaken and also surrendered. Although Perry won the battle on Niagara, he received the British surrender on the deck of the Lawrence. This display, a large part of the Fighting Sail exhibit, features a replica of the gun deck of Commodore Perry's first flagship during the Battle of Lake Erie, the USS Brig Lawrence. The Lawrence's gun deck has been blasted with live ammunition from the current Niagara's own cannons at a National Guard training facility. It recreates the damage inflicted upon both ships and men during the Battle of Lake Erie and throughout the Age of Fighting Sail. In this display, we learn about a sailor's life, including the living conditions on board a ship, how sailors were recruited, how they were paid, how they suffered casualties, their duties, what tools they used, and what food they ate. This display features information about sails and rigging and explains the differences in the type of rigs. For example, a brig is a two-masted vessel with square sails on both sides. This is another interactive exhibit as you can pull the rigging up and down. The knots display is also interactive. In this display, we learn about the aftermath of the Battle of Lake Erie, including the American celebration, grateful governments, the consequences of victory including casualties, and Perry's critical transfer from the Lawrence to the Niagara. Now you may have heard of the slogan, Don't Give Up the Ship. Well, it came directly from the War of 1812. On June 1, 1813, Lieutenant Oliver Hazard Perry's friend, Captain James Lawrence, commander of the frigate Chesapeake, was mortally wounded in a battle with the British frigate Shannon near Boston, Massachusetts. When he was told his ship was lost, Lawrence replied, quote, Keep the guns going and fight the ship till she sinks. Don't give up the ship. Blow her up. End quote. In spite of his dying orders, the Chesapeake surrendered after 15 minutes of battle. 
The Secretary of the Navy named Perry's flagship Lawrence in Captain Lawrence's honor, and Perry adopted Don't Give Up the Ship as his battle slogan. Here we learn more about the American and British navies and armies and see some of the weapons of war. In 1812, the American Navy was small, with only 17 ships that could sail on the ocean. However, three of these were frigates that were among the most powerful in the world. There were also 165 gunboats that helped protect America's seaports. The British, on the other hand, had over 700 ships and had the largest and most powerful navy in the world. Even though America's navy was only 20 years old, it had been battle-tested in two relatively unknown conflicts. The Quasi-War with France from 1798 to 1800 and the War with Tripoli from 1801 to 1805. This gave American officers and enlisted men battle experience that would help them later in the War of 1812. In 1913, the remains of the Niagara were brought up 100 years after it was purposely sunk in Misery Bay at Presque Isle, and the wood was used to make items like the chair you see here. The ship was reconstructed, but lack of maintenance led to its closing and it sank in 1929. She was raised again and reconstructed decades later for a second time. This is a cutaway model of the Niagara where you can see the interior as well as the exterior. This is the 1988 working replica of the original Niagara, the third incarnation of the ship, and you can usually board the ship and explore. The ship is sometimes available for sailings. We now head up to the second floor. One of the highlights, if not the highlight, is the section on the USS Wolverine, formerly the USS Michigan. The USS Michigan was the United States Navy's first iron-hulled warship, and it served during the American Civil War. It was made in Pittsburgh and assembled in Erie from 1842 to 1843. She was first commissioned in 1844 and operated on the Great Lakes out of Erie. She was renamed the USS Wolverine in 1905 to free up the name Michigan for a new battleship named the USS Michigan. The ship was scrapped in 1949. This is the double wheel of the ship, which was commissioned in 1844 and added to the ship in 1848. In 1950, Wolverine's prow was erected as a monument in Wolverine Park in Erie, near the shipyard where she had been assembled. On February 22, 1998, the prow was moved to the Erie Maritime Museum for restoration, and today it continues to be on display. The Michigan's bell was cast in Pittsburgh in 1843. It was used for timekeeping, as a fire alarm, and as a warning signal during fog. This section is dedicated to the Navy admirals who came from Erie, Pennsylvania.
We're now in the generating station control room. This machine controlled the five steam generators. This room also features various nautical instruments and charts and some model ships. We're back on the main floor, and thanks to the guides alerting us, we got a nice surprise. The Letty G. Howard, which we were originally hoping to sail on, is now sailing into the dock, back from Cleveland after undergoing routine maintenance. The Letty G. Howard was built in 1893, and it's believed that she is the last surviving Fredonia fishing schooner, a type of vessel that was used in the North Atlantic. Well, I hope you enjoyed the tour of the Erie Maritime Museum. To see more great Erie museums, please click on the video links you see on the screen. Thanks for watching.